Oh, can we go over number six? Sure. I would love to go over number six. I can't think of any problem more problematic than number six. Yay. OK, let me do one thing. OK, now. I was making a video and I didn't know if it would save properly if we were working on it, you know, like taking up bandwidth and stuff. OK, now you go over there and be good. And. We will now look at number six. Yes, OK. Determine the domain. See, this is number six. Okay, and flat. All right, this is what they want. Just to determine the domain, this is number six. All you have to do is take out the stuff underneath the radical. In other words, the argument of the function and you do this to it. There. Okay, that's all. Now, all we have to do is solve this inequality. Ten minus ten is zero. Then I divide by three, and I divide by three. So the answer to the domain, the domain of f of x. all x such that x is greater than or equal to negative 10 thirds. And that's all you have to do. Now what that means, of course, is you know that in the real number system, the real number system, the square root of negative 16 doesn't exist. Does, that's an S, doesn't exist. Um, there are no I numbers in the real number system. So um, what this says is that whatever you put under a square root radical or the radical of, of any, any kind of radical that has an even um, number out here, an even index. So 246810.
Okay, it's not going to work. So this says what we just said there, that this or anything else that's underneath the square root radical has got to be positive and a very quick way to say positive, the word positive. Here's my my friend. Wait a second here. Priorities. One, let me make sure I'm. I'm not. I got interrupted before when I was about to. Oh, I am recording. Never mind. Wait a minute. OK, this is this is this is George. George, who always comes and interrupts. When it's teaching time, that's right. Say hello, uh -huh. George. Yes, he purred through all uh, one of my. Um, uh, my my three hour class, he purred all the way through it, which is funny. It came out on the uh, recorder. OK, anyway, yeah, all you do have to do is say that whatever is underneath a square root radical um, is positive. So another way to say positive, and that's what I was saying. Positive, the word positive. Is the same thing as. Equal to or greater than zero. This is a, the math way of saying positive. Or even greater than zero, but this it's OK to be zero. Is that OK? Yes, that's perfect, Miss Barbara. Can we Great. go to number eight? Yes. Number eight. Miss Barbara. Yes. OK, so I'm sorry, but um, my Internet connection is kind of wonky and like you keep cutting out. So is there any way that you can upload this? Lecture later. Sure. To module 10. OK, in your Canvas you. class in your Canvas okay. class, module 10. OK, thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry about your Internet. It is OK. But wait, before you go, are you still there? Yes. Um, uh, all the notes and videos for all of our classes are in modules in Canvas. So if you go there, you'll find them all. OK. Thank okay, you. Bye bye. OK, number eight. Oh, that is ugly, isn't it? Very. Number eight. OK, we're going to have the square root. Of 12 times A to the seventh times B, then that means B to the one. Times the square root. Of eight a to the eighth power, b to the sixth power. OK, now we're going to multiply these, but first it's easier. It's a lot easier on us if we break all this stuff down um, first. So let's remember here and here that square roots have an invisible two index. So let's do this. You know that we have this rule.
OK, so that's a rule. So for instance, over here, it's going to be the easiest thing in the world to break this down. Because eight is four times two. OK, and. Let me get rid of that radical doesn't need to be that long. A can be written as A to the 8 over 2, B to the 6 over 2. So we're just looking at this one right now. Let's look at them separately, and then afterwards we'll multiply them. Um, so this, we know that the square root of 4 is 2. So what we have here is we're going to have the square root of 2 because that won't break down. But the square root of 4 times a to the 8 over 2, we know what that is, and b to the 6 over 2. This is going to be the square root of 2 times 2, the square root of 4 is 2, 8 to the 8 over 2 is 8 to the 4th. And b to the 6 over 2 is b to the 3rd. This one is harder, but 7 equals 6 plus 1. And a to the 6 times a to the 1 equals a to the 6 plus 1, which is a to the 7th. So I can do this. This is 4 times 3. Is that really 12? Huh, OK. 4 times 3. And that's an 8, which is 4 times 2. Doggone it. OK, A can be written as A to the 6 times A to the 1. And B is just B to the 1. OK, so notice that we, we're going to be able to take the square root of 4 and A to the 6 over 2, and what we're going to have left is the square root of 3 times a to the 1 times b to the 1. So this is going to be a 2, and a to the 6 over 3, uh, 6 over 2 is 3, a to the 3rd. So this is what we're going to have. We're going to have two, and we are multiplying them, yes, okay. Two a to the third times the square root of three ab times two a to the fourth b to the third times the square root of two. So what we're going to do, we're going to multiply the numbers out, numbers and letters outside the radical, 2a Yeah, that's a to the third. I should have put it closer. There. Because 6 over 2 is 3. This is going to be a to the third. times 2a to the 4th, b to the 3rd, and we got that from here. 8 over 2 is 4, 6 over 2 is 3, and then 
we're going to have the square root of 3AB times the square root of 2. So when we multiply these together, we're going to have 4 a to the third times a to the fourth times b to the third times the square root of 6ab. Now coming back over here, a to the third times a to the fourth is a to the three plus four. So this will be four times a to the three plus four times b to the third, times the square root of 6ab, and finally, since 3 plus 4 is 7, we're going to have 4a to the seventh, b to the third, times the square root of 6ab. Ah, okay. Awesome. Um, can we go over number 12? Yes. Let me save this. I knew it would do that. There. Number 12. Okay, number 12. Okay, we have this formula, R equals two times the square root of five times capital L. And that's used to ap approximate speed R, so let's write this down, R equals speed. In miles per hour. Of a car that has left a skid mark of length L. So capital L equals the length. Of. a skid mark. Okay. So now, how far will a car skid at 80 miles per hour? So if the car is going at a speed of 80 miles per hour, what is the length of the skid? So 80 equals two times the square root of five L. Well, two is not under the radical. It's not under the square root radical. So I'm going to divide it out so it won't cause me any trouble. 80 divided by two is 40. The twos cancel here, and I'm left with the square root of 5L. Now I've got to get rid of this square root radical because L is trapped underneath. 
OK, that means I have to square both sides. Of this equation. Now squaring over here just takes the top off and I'm left with 5L. But 40 squared is 40 times 40, which is 1600. Then I divide by five on both sides. So now, um, probably 350, but let me make sure. So what, 1600 divided by five. I got 3,200. Okay. Oh, okay. 1,600 divided by 5. Enter. I get 320. 320. <laughs> Where did I get that extra zero? Yes, 320. My bad. <laughs> so those little extra zeros are like, are like minus signs. They creep in when you least expect it. So the length of the skid mark is going to be 320 feet. Let's see. Length in feet, yes. 320 feet. Awesome. Can we go over to the next question, 13? Sure. Oh, yes. This is so interesting. Why doesn't this go away? I wonder. Well, anyway, let me let me take a picture of this. I think we'll move it down here and start a new page. How about that? I like that. Now, as I recall, this is going to give us the measurements. So let's see what they are. Um, the length of the travel. See, find find the travel if the offset is 19.75 inches. And the advance, this horizontal side down here, is 11.25 inches. Now, um, this is side A, this is side B, this is side C, and we are going to, because we're talking about 
the length of the sides of a right triangle, we're going to uh, use a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay, so this is going to be 19.75 squared plus 11.25 squared is going to equal c squared. And that's what we're trying to find out. So now it's time for the trusty calculator. Nineteen point seventy five squared. Nineteen point seven five squared plus eleven point twenty five squared. Enter. So I get five sixteen point six two five. Five sixteen point six two five equals C squared. Let me make sure I copied that correctly. Five sixteen point six two five and this was nineteen point seventy five and eleven point twenty five. Okay, just making sure. Now Nobody cares what C squared equals. We do care what C equals. So I'm going to take the square root of both sides. Normally, if this were just a math problem and not a word problem, I would put a plus or minus here. But we're dealing with a real life problem. So, I mean, there's no such thing as negative length. So I'm just going to leave that symbol off. Where is my eraser? OK. There. Um, and OK, so C. C equals whatever that is. And so let's see what it is they want us to do. The length of the travel is about blank inches. Simplify your answer round to the nearest thousandth, which is three decimal places. So. the square root of 516.625, enter, okay, I get right there, 22.7293862, blah, 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 blah. This is the third decimal place right here. If that three were a five, six, seven, eight, or nine, it would cause the nine to round up to a 10, and we would have 730 right here. But thank goodness that three is smaller than five, and it won't cause the nine to move up. So our answer is just going to be 22.729. Twenty two point seven two nine inches. Write it up here. Twenty two point seven two nine. That seven does not need to be that big. <laughs> Godzilla seven.
there. Miss Barbara, do you yes. like back to the question? Like um the the question it says on the on the quiz? Yes. Yes, yes. Oh wait, wait, no, no. We'll get there. Don't panic. Don't panic. There it is. Yay, awesome. Give me one second. Awesome. Okay. You get it? I wrote the measurements yeah. um, right there if you yeah. need the measurements. Yes, thank you. I got that. Okay, good. And that was number 13, right? Yes, that was number 13. <coughs> okay, which one now? Let's go to number 14. Ah, oh, okay. All right. So, let us do this. This is number 14. Boom, boom. OK, here we are. And here we are. The easiest way I know of to handle this is. To draw, ooh, this is pretty convenient. I can use this for the X axis. And this for the Y axis. Oh. Well, doesn't have to be fancy, does it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six, negative seven, negative nine, negative ten. Okay, that's negative 10, and this is 1, and this is 2, and this is 8. All right, 1, 2, 8, and negative 10. Cool. Now, the re whole reason I drew this grid, I'm not really going to graph anything. All I'm going to look at is these, these numbers. Negative 8 negative, would be here. This would be negative eight. And positive two would be here. And so we have we have the domain divided into three parts. There's this area over here to the left. This is X to the left of negative eight. And this is X between two and negative eight.
And over here we have X off to the right of two. And in this area, X can equal two. And in this area, X can equal negative eight. And over here, X cannot equal negative eight. And there are three different functions in charge. Over here, you've got negative 2x And in here, you have, well, actually this is y equals. This is y equals, but all we've got is the number two. And over here, we've got y equals x plus 5. And that's what all this means. That over to the left of negative 8, you've got this in charge. Between negative 8 and 2, you've got this in charge. And to the right of positive 2, you've got this in charge. So now all I have to do is locate these numbers. So here's negative 10. It's in this area. So to find H of negative 10, I would just say negative 2 times negative 10, 10 minus 16. So this negative 2 times negative 10 is positive 20. Minus 16, that's going to be 4. And then h of 1, I have to come to wherever 1 is. 1, 1 is in this area between negative 8 and 2. So, if x is 1, y is going to equal 2. No matter what, it doesn't matter what the x's are in this area, y is always going to equal 2. Now, for h of 2, I have to decide which of these three functions are, go, are allowed to use two. So I look over here and I see, okay, X is equal to two or greater than two or to the right of two. So I can use this right here with a two in there. So this is going to be two plus five. This is going to be, okay, two, plus five, that'll be seven. And then for eight, eight is also over in this area. So we're going to use this function. So we're going to have eight plus five. Which is 13. And that's how you do that. And that's what it actually means. Miss Barbara, I did have a question. For h of 2, why can't it be y equals 2? Because right there it says less than 2. Mm -hmm. Oh, less than 2, because it's not equal to, right? If it had an equal sign, would this yes, be the Yes, then I could. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Let me know when you're ready to go on. Sure, let's go to number 15. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
OK, I'm going to have to actually do this. As opposed to writing anything down. Um, here we have 3 times the square root of X minus 5 and we're being asked to look at its transformations. So it says start with of uh, Start with the graph of h of x equals the square root of x. Then what is f of x going to do to the basic graph square root of x? Well, it says. We're going to shrink it horizontally, stretch it vertically, shrink it vertically, stretch it horizontally. So we have to stop and look at what they're talking about. And this number here in front will be the vertical stretch or the vertical shrink. So since this is a number greater than one, it's going to be the vertical stretch. So it'll take the square root of X and make it like that. So we're going to stretch it vertically by a factor of that number right there, three. And then finally shift it and you're given these choices. But notice you have a minus five over here at the end. That's a vertical shift and the minus sign means it goes down. So we're going down five. I'm going to check the answer. And there it is. The number in front is the vertical stretch if it's a number bigger than one or a vertical shrink if we have a number between zero and one, that is a fraction. Uh, the numbers at the end, at the very far right end, are added or subtracted, and that means you're shifting the, the basic graph up or down. Awesome, yes, I just wanted to make sure, because I was like, uh, in the previous, whenever we were doing these, um, you know how it was the opposite? I just wanted to confirm it wasn't this time. Right. It's opposite thought, if it's underneath the square root with X. Right. If it's underneath, then it's the opposite. But if, That's it's, right. if it's not, cool. Yay. Cool. cool. Okay, number 16. Sure. Am I going too fast? Uh, you're OK. I'm just writing down notes. OK, I'll let you write down before I go on. Oh, man, what a day. I know it's very sad. All I want to do is nap during rainy days like this. <laughs> All right, number 16. Yes. Another one. Yay. Okay, it says describe how the graph of the following function can be obtained from one of the basic graphs. I am actually going to write this in my notes because we have one, two, three transformations going on here. So, number 15. Oh, number 16. I know. I'm oh. just going to say is in recording. Gotcha. In recording. Number 16 is right here. g of x equals negative one half 
times x minus 4 squared. Okay, now, this, one half, forget the sign in front, one half means there's a vertical shrink. The negative sign means there's a reflection across the x-axis. which is the same thing as, as saying turns it upside down. Now, you talked about going the opposite way. First, let's say what the basic function is. The basic function here is going to be x squared. Right now, a minus four in the argument with X means you've got a horizontal shift, a sideways shift. horizontal sideways shift in the opposite direction. In the opposite direction from the sign. So here, x minus 4, if you set it equal to 0 and solve for x, this shows you which way x is really going. 4 to the right. If you just look at this the way it is, it looks like it's saying, okay, take it four units to the left, but it's not saying that. Once you set X minus four equal to zero and solve for X, you see that X is going four units to the right. So everything that occurs in the argument is very tricky. So when it comes to that, should we immediately know, hey, that's not a negative four, it's actually a positive four? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people just use the shortcut of memorizing it and they don't do this step. But I'd recommend everybody use that step at first 
until they get the idea. OK, so set it to zero. OK. So let's see. Um, start with the graph of y equals x squared, shift it, shift it right four units. Okay. Stretch or shrink. Well, that's going to be a shrink. Shrink it vertically by multiplying each y coordinate by one half. And then reflect it across the X axis. So it's those answers they're looking for right here. And I think I am going to copy the answer here, this line, and put it on your paper on the notes so everybody can see that. Okay, answers to number 16. Oops. Yay, yay for us. <laughs> We're getting a lot of work done. Yeah. OK, I assume you would like to go on to the next one. Sure. OK, this, let's look at what you do. The square root of negative 17. And this is number 17, right? Yes. Yeah. So. Now that's the answer, but the way I wrote it could be unacceptable. Ah, it is unacceptable. They want you to type the answer in the form A plus B I. So I'm going to have to do this differently. I'm going to have to take this in complex form, A plus B I form which is going to be zero plus the square root of 17 i. i is definitely outside the square root radical. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Pretty sneaky. So let's go here and do this. 
zero plus the square root. I don't have to do it here. It's the square root of 17. And then I have to, on my keyboard, hit the right arrow key to move to the outside. And then put a lowercase i. Let's see. Yeah, that's what they're looking for. Okay, cool. Now, if that if that sentence hadn't been there, it would have been enough just to leave it this way. I times the square root of 17. Mm, okay. But this is the fancy way to write it. <laughs> Can we do the same one just with negative two? Sure. The square root of negative two equals Hello, Ava. Here's my doggy. Hello, Doggies Ava. and kitties. Negative one times positive two. That's the square root of negative one times the square root of two. Well, in the in the uh, complex number system, the square root of negative one exists, and it is the letter I or what the letter I stands for. So the casual way of writing this would be I times the square root of two. But the uh, A plus B I form is zero plus the square root of two I. Yay! Yay! Okay, now we're going to hit the hard spot. Let's go to uh, number 20. Okay. You've got this all planned. I'm so glad. I can count on you to ask good questions. <laughs> Consider the quadratic function below. Find the vertex, find the axis of symmetry, determine whether there is a maximum or a minimum value, and find that value. Okay. Oh no, it won't let you see it. <laughs> I, I don't care. Care if it lets me see it. Okay, so here's the whole question. Okay, now this is number 20. Yes. All right, now, all right, first, the first thing I want to do is decide whether or not this is cupped up or cupped down. And because this first term is positive, it's a cupped up parabola and it looks like this. And here's the vertex at the bottom. So that's what we're dealing with. Now, A, to find the vertex. Which is 
the ordered pair HK in which X of H is the X coordinate and K is the Y coordinate. And H has this wonderful, easy little formula, negative B over 2A. So all I have to do is look at X squared minus 6X plus 5, and I can see that A is 1, and B equals negative 6. So this is going to be negative, negative 6 over 2 times 1. So that'll be negative 6 divided by 2 is negative 3. You'll have negative, negative 3, which is positive 3. So the H is going to be 3. Now the K is what you get when you put that H number in for every X. So this is going to be 3 squared minus 6 times 3 plus 5. It's going to be 9 minus 18 plus 5. 9 minus 18 is negative 9 plus 5. That's going to equal negative 4. So the vertex is at negative, uh, at positive 3, negative 4. Okay. Any explanation needed? Now, first, first you find H with this formula. Then you substitute the H, the number you get from H, into the function. And that gives you your K. Yes. OK, great. Now, B, find the axis of symmetry. The axis of symmetry is a vertical line that goes up and down through the vertex. And its equation is always x equals the h number. Well, the h number in this problem is 3. So, x equals 3. You have to have the x there and the equal sign and the, the h number. Because this is the equation of a vertical line. Awesome. So when we input it into the answer box, always put x equals 3, not just 3 because it will count it wrong, right? That's right. And then I have to come back and say, well, I know what she meant. And so I would probably give you full credit. But that's more work for me. Save me work and write X equals three. I will, Miss Barbara, I will. Very good. OK, I want to write this first. Equation of axis of symmetry. All right, C, determine whether there is a maximum or minimum value and find the value. Well, how I was taught to do this is to look at the parabola and then at the vertex and ask yourself, is that the highest point or the lowest point? And it's the lowest point on this graph. So lowest 
is minimum. So C, there is a minimum value. If it's kept up, it's always minimum. And if it's kept down, it's always maximum, right? Yes, very good. So the minimum value is tee -dee, the K number. Woohoo! And that's always going to be true. The minimum value is the K number. The maximum value is the K number. I mean, if you had a cupped up parabola, if you had a cup down parabola, you would have a maximum value and that would be whatever K was. Now this, this has to be the biggest, uh, this has to be the biggest um, thing I mess up on. Okay, Gra uh, plot. Wait a minute, I'm writing it in words. <laughs> See, to graph. Plot the vertex first. And then one other point. So we know that the vertex is three, negative four. We need one other point. And look at this. The number on the end is the y-intercept. That's a nice small number we can easily graph. So when you can, choose the y-intercept. Now, if it's way beyond the limits of your graph, you're not gonna be able to graph it, so you're gonna have to find a point closer in. And then you would wanna use a number one or two numbers away from, a, a number for x that's one or two numbers away from the h number. That usually works really well. So anyway, however, we have a great, very easy y-intercept. So first I'm going to graph the vertex, and then I'm going to graph the point 0, 05. And then if I need more points, I'll swear. You stupid thing! Okay, so let's do this. I am going to have to bring this down. Uh -uh. Okay. Oh, they're good. I bet they're going to make me do this. All right. Three. Negative four. OK, find an equation for the axis of symmetry. X equals three. Minimum value parabola opens upward and has a minimum value of negative four. And now Click the graph. What I want to do is graph a parabola. 
So it says, uh, click on the graph to plot your vertex. I wish it were bigger. Okay, three, negative four. And look in the upper right hand corner. Three negative four is where I'm at. I always double check up there. Now, five, a zero five is up here. I'm going to save and I'm going to check. Okay. Woohoo! Yeah, pretty good. Oh, I have to check my answer again. Yeah. Oh, it just stays there. It's not turning <laughs> gray or anything. All right, well, whatever. Awesome. Um. Um. Can we do the same one, but with a different value? Sure. Ooh, here's one. Same kind of problem, different numbers. Number 21, awesome. Number 21. So I'm going to copy this. Okay, so here we have a quadratic function. There, make it nice and big. And we're going to find the vertex. So A is negative 2 and B is negative 2 and h equals negative b over 2a. So, h is going to equal negative, negative 2 over 2 times negative 2. So we're going to have negative times negative is positive two over two times negative two is negative four, which is negative one half. So over here, H equals negative one half. K equals negative two times negative one half squared minus two times negative one half plus one. So this is going to be negative two times negative one half 
times positive one fourth minus, oh, this is minus minus, that'll be a plus. Two times one half is one plus one, which will be negative two times one fourth is negative one half plus one plus one. Negative one half plus one is positive one half plus one. And that'll be 1.5 or three over two. And that's what K equals. So the vertex is going to be the point negative one half, three over two. But really, for, for later graphing, that's negative 0.5, 1.5. You know, when you graph, it gives you decimals, so this will just make life a little easier. Hi, Ayla. Hi, Ayla, baby. Hi. Ayla's reminding me it's almost her lunch time. Yay! Actually, she's probably saying in doggy language that it is her lunch time, but actually it's 10 minutes till her lunch time. So we can finish this problem. Okay. A little mark there. All right, now, now that we have this, the axis of symmetry is x equals negative one half. And c, well, this, uh, is it, does it have a, a maximum or a minimum value? And find the value. It's a maximum. Yes, it okay. is. Very good. Maximum value is 3 over 2, which is probably how my math lab wants you to answer. And then D. Graph it. Okay. So Guarantee my dog does not want to go out in this weather. She's a black lab, a water dog, but she has never liked running around in the rain. Oh no! Well, no, good too because she knows that you know it's never good to be wet. Oops. Yes. One divided by two. Right arrow key, comma, three over two. Right arrow key, parentheses. And the axis of symmetry is x equals negative 1 divided by 2. Right arrow key. And it has a maximum, the parabola has a maximum and the maximum value is three over two.
and OK. Click. There we go. And this is going to be pretty easy to find um, the halves and all that. So there's our parabola. We do the vertex first. Here's negative one half. And then go up to positive 1.5. And there it is. And then, oops, I look at the number on the end, it's a one. Right here, one on the Y axis. Now I have a horrible feeling that I'm wrong, but I'm right. Yay! I was hey, ready good for job, Barbara. I was ready for it to say I was wrong. Yes? I'm like, good job, Miss Barbara. Yay! Okay. Let's take a quick look at 22. Let's do 24. Yay, okay. Because I think that that's very tricky, and then I have to go feed my poor hungry dog who's unloved and left in the cold, cruel world. Not true. Okay, and this is number 24, is that what I said? Yes. What? This is going to need its own page. Okay, number 24, we have to find all the information all the information about this lovely function right there. Okay. So the first thing they're asking for is the domain, I believe. So just look at the denominator. Just look at the bottom. Okay, and if I add four to both sides, I will get X equals four. This is the number that cannot exist um, 
um, that cannot be in the domain because if you do, you'll have four minus four equals zero. You'll have a zero on the bottom of the function and it means terrible, terrible things are happening. It means an explosion. That's right, an explosion. So we're not going to let X equal four, that's for sure. Better not to even let it get close. But if you write this in set notation, You would write it like that, all x such that x doesn't equal 4. So x can be any real number, but not x equals 4. Or, if you're writing this in interval notation, negative infinity to 4. That's the left side of 4, unioned up with the right side of 4 to infinity but not for itself. That's the domain, that's not going to change. Now, number 24, I wanna make sure everybody reading this knows where it comes from. Okay, now, I am going to factor this function. Okay, so factor function. X plus four. Whoop. X plus four times X minus four over X minus four The X minus fours cancel out, leaving you with X plus four. Now X minus four would have given you your vertical asymptote. given is a better word, would have given you your vertical asymptote. but it was canceled out. I don't know if that's, there's two L's there or not. I'm gonna put them there, but it was canceled. Now, it, is just a hole in the graph. OK, 
Okay. So now the function. So. No, VA, vertical asymptote, or HA. No HA. Yeah, because the same reason for both of them. Because No denominator. So you don't have a vertical asymptote or a horizontal asymptote here. However, Let's check on the X intercepts and Y intercepts. Set X plus four equal to zero and solve. Now let's make sure there's nothing wrong with X minus four. I mean, X equals negative four, and there isn't. Now, if it had been positive four, we would have said there is no X intercept, but it's not. So there's nothing wrong with negative four. So our X intercept is going to be negative four, zero. Our Y intercept is F of zero. So we have F of X equals X plus four. F of zero is always the Y intercept. So the y-intercept is the point zero, four. Is there any problem with x being zero? And no, there is not. So the y-intercept is the point zero, four, four on the y-axis. You would think that the four would be would not be acceptable since up there it says X cannot equal four. But in this case, since it's the Y, then it's perfectly fine, right? Uh, right, because it's the Y. Very good. Yay. Smarty. <laughs> OK, so we've got all this data now.
Now let's check out this. The X intercepts is R. The X intercept is negative four zero. Oh, the domain of the function. We have to start there. The domain of the function is type your answer in interval notation. Okay. So, um, the domain of the function is X can't equal negative four. So, negative infinity, comma, four, close parentheses, union, open parentheses, four, comma, infinity, close parentheses. Okay, what is the x-intercept of the fun function? Select the choice below, and if necessary, fill in the answer box. The x-intercept of the function is negative four, zero. Negative four, comma, Zero. What is the y intercept? The y intercept of the function is zero, four. Find any vertical asymptotes. The vertical asymptote is our no vertical asymptotes. Find any horizontal asymptotes. There are no horizontal asymptotes. Find an oblique asymptote. There is no oblique asymptote. Okay. Choose the graph of the function. The graph of this function now is going to be f of x, which is really just y, equals x plus 4. And the only graph that could be is this one complete with a whole at x equals four. So let's try to make that bigger. You see all that's left is the graph of a straight line with a hole in it. Each of these is two, so you've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. Each of these, these scale marks is a two. So this is negative four. This is positive four. This is at X equals four, a hole in the graph because X equals four is not in the domain. Four is not in the domain. So I'm going for A and then I'm gonna check my answer Whoa, so I'm right. Woohoo! Yeah, I don't expect anybody to get all of this correct. I expect there'll be lots of partial credit on this. <laughs> 